Good afternoon. My name is Imran Rasool, and as Managing Editor of the Journal of the European Economic Association, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the 16th GIA FBBVA lecture. The FBBVA keynote lecture is now a central event on the academic calendar for economists, and we sincerely thank the Foundation for their continued support. The lecture is first given at the American Economic Association meetings in January, and then later in the year in Madrid. The lecture will be published in the December issue of GIA this year. Let me take this opportunity to say a few words about the Journal of the European Economic Association. The journal was founded in 2003 with the aim of becoming one of the top tier general interest journals in economics, publishing work from all areas, including theory, macroeconomics and applied microeconomics. I'm glad to say it is well on the way of achieving its mission. Submissions to the journal are at an all time high, as is the two year impact factor of the work that we published. I'm proud to be leading a team of dedicated editors at GIA, ably assisted by an editorial board drawing on all the best talent in economics from around the world. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Monica Piazzesi, the Joan Kenny Professor of Economics at Stanford University. Since graduating with a PhD from Stanford in 2000, Monica has provided foundational contributions to multiple areas of macroeconomics, including on topics relating to housing markets, asset pricing, and the term structure of interest rates. Her work has now been cited over 11,000 times. Beyond her academic contributions, Monica has provided great service to the profession, including as co-editor at the Journal of Political Economy and associate editor at the American Economic Review. She currently sits on the Research Council of the Bundesbank. Monica has won numerous prestigious awards during her career, including the Elaine Bennett Research Prize that's awarded every other year to recognize outstanding contributions by young women in the economics profession. I'm very much looking forward to, to listen to and learn from Monica's FBBVA lecture today that is titled, How Unconventional is Green Monetary Policy? Welcome, Monica. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, so this is joint work with Melina Papuzzi at the ECB and Martin Schneider at Stanford. In the current low interest rate environment, uh, the main tool for monetary policy has been unconventional monetary policy, uh, asset purchases. Governments have been buying uh, government bonds, mortgage-backed securities, other assets, and more recently, uh, corporate bonds. The goal of these purchases is to lower firms' cost of capital and thereby to stimulate investment. Uh, the question then is, which corporate bonds should central banks buy? The conventional view is that monetary policy should aim for uh, market neutrality, which means that asset purchases lower the cost of capital for all firms equally, uh, and monetary policy does not introduce relative price distortion. And in practice, uh, this uh, market neutrality has been implemented by central bank uh, in the following way. They purchase bonds proportional to the amount of bonds outstanding. In this paper, we want to ask uh, what are market neutral purchases of corporate bonds? Uh, what would you recommend central banks to do when they are trying to be market neutral? Uh, are purchase, current purchases market neutral? Uh, and what are optimal purchases uh, in a world where you have both financial frictions and climate externalities? The empirical work uh, measures the carbon footprint of ECB purchases. Um, so the question is, which corporate bonds has the ECB been buying? And so here we measure the ECB's sectoral portfolio. Uh, we use data on individual bonds. The majority of these bonds is issued by special purpose entities. So it's actually some work to understand which sectors of the economy issue these bonds. Uh, so we, here we have to do some work. We have to hand match corporate bonds that are issued by these special purpose entities and assign them to the non-financial sectors that issue them. 
then we uh, measure uh, the market portfolio in three different ways. Uh, so we use three alternative measures. These are all concepts of capital. Uh, Luckily, all these three alternative measures give you a very similar results, uh, which is that the ECB portfolio looks a lot like the sector shares of emissions in the economy. They do not look like, uh, so the portfolio does not look like the market portfolio in the economy. And so that raises the question, why does the ECB overweigh dirty sectors in its portfolio? The reason is uh, that the ECB purchases are proportional to bonds outstanding. Uh, so dirty sectors happen to issue more bonds and they have a lower, relatively lower market share. Um, and so that's the main reason for why the ECB, when it buys proportional to bonds outstanding, ends up with a portfolio that looks dirty. Uh, the eligibility requirements uh, don't change this basic pattern. So it's really which firms are issuing bonds. Then we want to understand uh, in, in the world, what is it uh, that uh, generates price distortions and how would you uh, form a portfolio as a central bank uh, that tries to avoid price distortion. Uh, so for that, we need a model. Uh, the model I'm going to show you is a multi-sector growth model with climate externalities and financial frictions in which sectors differ by their riskiness and by their emission intensity. And asset purchases work through risk premia. Uh, the effects differ by sector. There is a direct effect of asset purchases. Uh, they lower the firm's cost of capital. And there's also an indirect effect uh, because asset purchases are typically financed with more safe government debt. Uh, and that lowers risk premia, which benefits risky sectors more. So this is a general equilibrium effect that is indirect uh, that also uh, affects risk premia and benefits risky sectors more. In this world, we can ask what is market neutral? What is a market neutral policy? It leaves the sector's relative costs of capital unchanged. That means that the market portfolio or the sectoral capital shares are unchanged. A market neutral purchase uh, underweighs risky sectors uh, to counteract this general equilibrium effect, uh, except in special cases of this model uh, that don't look very realistic. The, uh, there's evidence on pollution premia, uh, and so that means that underweighing risky sectors uh, translates into underweighing brown sectors. So this is what a market neutral policy does. So this is not what we saw in the data where we saw that the ECB is overweighing brown sectors. Uh, in terms of what is optimal in this world, uh, an optimal policy designs a carbon tax and an asset purchase program uh, in the following way. So the optimal purchases address the financial frictions um, and because financial frictions are st stricter or stronger for risky sectors, uh, an optimal policy would over overweigh risky sectors while the carbon tax addresses uh, the um, climate externalities. We can also ask what, uh, how should monetary policy work in a world without a carbon tax, which is the cur uh, world we're currently living in. Uh, then it's beneficial to overweigh green firms. Uh, so central banks in the complete absence of a carbon tax uh, would try to lower the cost of capital of green companies by overweighing them in their portfolio. In terms of the literature, uh, we uh, the work relates to uh, a large literature on unconventional monetary policy that uh, tries to measure the price impact of these policies and also tries to understand the economic mechanisms through which unconventional monetary policy may have an effect, uh, real effects on the economy. Our model builds on integrated assessment models in which uh, the environment, the state of the environment, has an effect on uh, production, and in particular on TFP. So how effect, how uh, productive uh, ec um, firms are in their production. We also relate to an empirical asset pricing literature that documents uh, large pollution premia for firms uh, that have high pollution. They have to 
pay a higher cost of capital. And this literature uh, is part of a, an exploding literature on climate finance. Uh, so in recent years, there has been much interest uh, in climate finance, and this slide is not enough uh, to give justice to all the papers that are being written in this area. So in terms of data, uh, we merge several data sets. At the individual firm level, we merge uh, ECB holdings of uh, securities, the so purchases of individual bonds. We have data on every individual bond that the ECB has purchased. We also have data on the amount of bonds outstanding of individual companies. Then we have data on emissions. Uh, these are scope one, two, and three emissions. Uh, so scope one emissions are uh, the most direct measure of emissions, of carbon emissions uh, that companies emit. Uh, and then scope two is uh, indirect emissions that come from the uh, energy use of uh, firms, for example, electricity use. And then scope three emissions are the most indirect uh, measure of these emissions. They include, for example, what consumers uh, emit when they're driving a car, for example, that's included in the emissions of the car manufacturer. Uh, so different uh, measures of emissions, and they come from a company called Urgentum that collects this data. Then we have sector level uh, data. Uh, so these are NACE2 sectors where we have scope one emissions, so direct emissions from Eurostat air emission accounts. Uh, we have value added wages and output from Eurostat. And then we have various measures of uh, assets, the value of assets of companies. So total book assets and output and the market value for public firms from Orbis. A very important aspect of this data work on seeing which firms issue bonds are these special purpose entities that are already mentioned. So for example, uh, the ECB buys bonds from Royal Dutch Shell, which is an oil manufacturer. The uh, bonds that Royal Dutch Shell issued are actually not directly issued by Royal Dutch Shell, but instead they're issued by a finance company, which is called Shell International Finance. Uh, and so that company, if you look it up in Bloomberg, it belongs to the finance sector. Uh, so if you start looking at the ECB portfolio without treating these special purpose entities, uh, then you'll find that 56% of the ECB holdings belong to the finance sector. But actually, if you go through them one by one, you see that all these special purpose entities, there are daughter companies of uh, a parent that uh, tries to issue these bonds. And so we assign these bonds to the parent, uh, to the right sector, uh, and then reduce these uh, bond holdings in the finance sector to 11%. Um, it is difficult to go much beyond uh, that because these remaining 11% are um, finance companies that issue bonds for various comp small companies. And so it's difficult to assign these to the right sector. And so from now on, I will just consider uh, issuance of bonds by non-financial firms. So we'll ignore these 11%. Um, we also need market shares of each sector. So here we want a measure of how much capital uh, is in sector N uh, as a share of the total uh, capital in the economy. And so ideally we would need, we would have the market value of equity and debt. So the combined value, including any kind of intangible capital, uh, everything that might makes up the market value of the company. Uh, so the ideal measure doesn't exist in the data. So we uh, use three different measures. Um, our benchmark results uh, use the theoretical condition that says, uh, without any frictions, the marginal product of capital would be equalized to the cost of capital. Uh, and if uh, rates of returns or cost of capital are all the same and depreciation rates are the same across sectors, then we can look at capital income uh, and compare that across sectors because it will imply how much capital is in the sector. And we do have a measure of capital income, which is the difference between value added and wages in Eurostat. 
So this is our benchmark measure, but then we uh, supplement it with two other measures. The second measure is book assets. So we have book assets uh, to revenues from Orbis by sector. We multiply that uh, by output in Eurostat, and that gives us a measure of book assets by sector. And finally, we have market value, but only for public farms, uh, because public farms issue equity and then Orbis uh, gives us the, the market value of, of equity and debt. So let me show you uh, the results. So here's the, the main result. So here are our measure of market shares um, measured from capital income by sector. So here you see the various sectors, uh, agriculture, automobile, then we have a sector that we call dirty manufacturing. Uh, so the European economy has a large sector of manufacturing that we split up into two. One uh, dirty manufacturing contains the subsectors of manufacturing that have large emissions. Uh, so oil and coke, chemicals, basic metals and non-metallic minerals. Uh, so we put all of these in a sector that we call dirty manufacturing and then there's other manufacturing. And then there are utilities, transportation and services. And so what you see here, these red bars, these are the market shares of each sector. When you look at capital income on the horizontal uh, axis, you see the fraction of total market share of the total market value of these companies, uh, these sectors you see that the service sector is the largest sector. Uh, so the European economy is a uh, highly developed economy in which the service sector is the largest sector uh, and other sectors are smaller, uh, like automobile, dirty manufacturing, all of these sectors are smaller compar compared to services. Let's look at what the ECB holds in its portfolio. These are the blue bars. Uh, so again, red bars were market shares of capital and the blue bars now is uh, the portfolio shares of the various sectors in the ECB portfolio. And so what you see is that the ECB buys uh, bonds issued by uh, the automobile industry, uh, dirty manufacturing utilities, and then it also buys uh, bonds issued by the service sector, uh, but much less so than the market share of the service sector. So you see the red bar is large compared to what the ECB buys in terms of bonds issued by companies in this sector. Let's look at the emissions. So these are scope one emissions. Uh, these are the gray bars. Uh, and so what you see is that uh, agriculture actually has quite a few emissions uh, and then dirty manufacturing and utilities. Uh, and the service sector is a relatively clean sector. It has low emissions compared to its large market value. As your eye tries to compare the uh, red blue and gray bars, uh, what you see is that what the ECB is overweighing is dirty manufacturing and utilities in its portfolio and it is underweighing services and services is a relatively clean sector. Uh, so the ECB is overweighing relatively dirty industries. We can look at how these results look like with a different measure of capital. Here, here we're measuring capital by total assets from Orbis uh, and you basically get the same result. The largest sector is the service sector, dirty manufacturing and utilities are the smaller sectors and the ECB is overweighing services. Sorry, the ECB is underweighing services, it is overweighing dirty manufacturing and utilities. So the ECB portfolio, the main result is that it looks like the sector shares of emissions. Uh, it does not look like the market portfolio because it is overweighing these brown sectors that are uh, have a relatively lower share in the market portfolio and it is underweighing services, which uh, is the lion's share of the European economy. And the question then becomes why? Why is the ECB uh, putting together a portfolio of bonds that uh, is issued by dirty companies. Uh, the reason is uh, illustrated in this graph. Uh, so in this graph you see more bars, you see the red bars that you saw before which is the market share of each sector. Then there's a darker red which is uh, the bonds, the amount of bonds outstanding of each sector. So this is the bond market, so this is the darker red. Then there is a violet bar which is what 
how many bonds there are that are eligible for the corporate bond purchase program of the ECB. And then uh, the blue line, blue bars are the ECB holdings. And so what you see is your, as your eye, eyes compare these different bars, what you see is what the ECB is doing is they're basically buying proportional to bonds outstanding uh, and the whether or not these bonds are eligible or not, that doesn't change the picture. The ECB is just doing its best uh, to buy bonds um, relative to the amount of bonds outstanding. That's the policy. This is how uh, the ECB also describes its purchases. They buy proportionally to the bond, the amount of bonds outstanding and the eligibility criteria don't change this basic finding. Uh, if you, I showed you results with scope one emissions. If you actually look at other, uh, the other scope emissions, so indirect measures of indirect emissions, scope three emissions, uh, then uh, the ECB portfolio appears even dirtier. Uh, so the picture looks worse when you include indirect emissions. Then you may wonder, well, the ECB is just one of many investors in the corporate bond market. Uh, actually, in the paper, we show that the ECB buys a large share of uh, newly issued bonds in each sector. So it's, an, it's a large player in these markets. So now we want to understand uh, these results within a, a, a model and we want to understand what is uh, market neutral uh, within a model uh, and what would be optimal for central banks to do. So for that we need uh, a framework and the framework we're going to use is a growth model with climate externalities and financial frictions. It has a standard representative agent with preferences over a final consumption good. Uh, the representative agent inelastically supplies one unit of labor and the final good is made out of uh, different intermediate goods uh, and different intermediate goods uh, using this Cobb Douglas production function with coefficients gamma n for each sector and uh, there are sector specific climate externalities in production. In so here's how we capture them. Uh, we say TFP in each sector, that's Z, uh, Z depends on temperature eta. Uh, and temperature itself is raised by emissions uh, from the various sectors. Uh, so little yt uh, n is the uh, output in sector n and epsilon is the um, emission intensity of that sector. And so you see that the temperature today is basically the temperature yesterday plus new emissions. Uh, and the, these new emissions are come with output of the various sectors times their emission intensity. And so the higher the temperature, the lower TFP. And so this is a feature uh, that we're taking from these integrated assessment models uh, that the state of the environment, which here we call temperature, affects TFP. And now there are also financial frictions. And in particular, we think of households as having two technologies to hold capital firms. Uh, there are capital holdings, um, K Wigo, uh, that goes that are held by households uh, through a public technology. And there's also a private technology uh, through which households hold capital K. Both of these technologies come with balance sheet costs. So there are some cost functions. Uh, H, Wago and H, which give you the costs of holding capital. So these are resource costs uh, in terms of the final good. And uh, they are increasing. So the more capital households hold, the higher are these balance sheet costs. They're quasi convex and homogeneous of degree one. Uh, the private costs, the H, also depend on holdings of government debt. Uh, so what is the interpretation of these balance sheet costs? Uh, the interpretation is that there are risky investments, they are costly, uh, some don't pan out, in that case resources are gone, and holding more capital is riskier, it's associated with more costs. The risks also depends on the holding of uh, safe government debt, uh, so that lowers the risks of holding capital when you hold more capital, uh, more government debt. Uh, so these balance sheet costs are, uh, show up when private intermediaries uh, invest in capital uh, using this private technology, or they may also invest in government bonds. Uh, so who are these private intermediaries? They're companies that are competitive 
they're owned by the households and they maximize shareholder value. So these intermediaries hold capital in government bonds, uh, then they get some return on these investments. Uh, that's the first term uh, that's multiplied, that's valued by uh, MT plus one, which is the pricing kernel of the households. Uh, so this is how households, which are the shareholders of these companies, value these returns. And then there's the balance sheet cost involved of holding, of making these investments. And the balance sheet costs are homogeneous of degree one, which means that these firms run a constant returns to scale uh, technology. We can then look at first other conditions of these private intermediaries uh, and they uh, look like this. They come in the form of the pricing kernel of the household values the return on uh, capital holdings in sector N and that's equal to uh, one plus a return premium over the short rate. Uh, and so these are the marginal balance sheet costs of investing more in sector N. Uh, that's this partial derivative of this balance sheet cost function H with respect to holdings in uh, sector N. The M is just the usual pricing kernel of households. It's the marginal rate of substitution of households. It's how households value consumption tomorrow relative to consumption today. Uh, and if you want to compute the safe rate uh, that is implied by this pricing kernel, you just uh, you use the, the standard uh, order equation, which says that the pricing kernel times the safe rate is equal to one. So you see that the return premium is really this term that I have here in pink which shows you uh, the premium over the risk-free rate. Uh, what do firms do? Intermediate good firms, they issue claim to capital income, they pay a rate of return on capital, they hire labor at some wage W, they sell goods at a price PN in competitive markets, and then they may pay a carbon tax if there is a tar carbon tax per unit of emissions, and then they maximize profits, uh, which are just revenues uh, net of car the carbon tax minus how much the uh, factors are paid. The final uh, goods firms buy intermediate goods at some price PN and then sell the final, final good at price one. And so if you look at the firm's first order conditions, they look like standard first uh, firm's first order condition, which equate the marginal product of the, of the input to its price. And so this is the marginal product of capital, which is equated to the cost of capital. Uh, and so here it's just net of the carbon tax. Uh, and you see this is the cost of capital, um, Rn for sector N, but we know from the previous slide that this uh, cost of capital contains a return premium over the short rate. Uh, so there is a premium that the sector N has to pay to its uh, capital, on its capital, so it faces a higher cost of capital than in a frictionless world. Uh, how does the equilibrium of this model look like? Uh, so basically here credit flows from households to competitive intermediaries, which then invest in these competitive farms. And a government policy is to also choose holdings of capital uh, and to issue debt. Uh, so holdings of capital are financed through debt of the government. And then the government has a budget constraint that says uh, that the, the government can hold uh, capital, makes these investments, it pays interest on uh, previous debt issuance, and then gets receipts in the form of returns on capital. It also issues new debt and then raises the carbon tax if it wants to. And so any extra revenues from the carbon tax uh, are basically rebated to households. So if there are high returns on uh, capital holdings and the carbon tax, uh, they are rebated lump sum in this world to households. So there are no redistributive uh, uh, effects from rebating uh, the policy. So this is basically the Baker Schultz plan uh, in, in our model uh, is raise a carbon tax and rebate it uh, per person back to households. And then agents optimize and clear and markets clear.
So let me first think about the frictionless benchmark of this uh, model. Uh, so what would happen uh, if there were no frictions, uh, no financial frictions? Uh, so then uh, in each sector, there would be a, uh, an amount of capital as a fraction of total capital. So these are the, my capas is the market portfolio of capital, uh, which solves the following equation. It basically, the market portfolio equates marginal products. Uh, so all the marginal products of capital get equated to the cost of capital, uh, which then gets equated to the safe rate of interest uh, from households. And so what market shares do is they just reflect the technology and preferences in this model. So kappa n, how much capital is in sector n, is purely dictated uh, from te technology and preferences. So in this frictionless world, Modigliani, Miller and Ricardian equivalents hold. Uh, so here asset purchases are irrelevant for investment in the climate. So the government can basically do what it wants. Uh, it can buy assets, but if it does so, the private sector simply undoes the policy and you get the same market portfolio. So there's nothing the government in a frictionless world can do uh, to change the market portfolio. And so here I want to uh, mention that you'll see uh, on the, in the blogosphere and other commentators uh, the following arguments, which is that central banks are powerless, uh, financial frictions don't matter. Uh, that's one statement you read. And then the second statement that the same commentators often make is that it's very important that central bank design their purchases to be market neutral. Uh, and so what you see here is that these two statements don't hang together because uh, if it is really true that financial frictions don't matter, then we're in this frictionless world, then it doesn't matter what the central bank does because you get the same market uh, portfolio no matter what the central bank does. Uh, and so the, the same, so any single person uh, cannot make these same, these two statements together um, because the private sector always undoes the policy. Let's look at a world with financial frictions, which is a world in which central banks do have some power over the cost of capital of firms. Uh, so here now we, uh, we are equating the marginal product of capital to the cost of capital, but the cost of capital has incorporated a marginal holding costs for private uh, intermediaries of holding this capital. Uh, and so here now we're solving for the market portfolio in equilibrium by equating marginal products, but net of holding costs. What you see immediately is that sectors that have higher marginal holding costs, so where this pink term is larger, will have uh, higher premia over the short rate, over the safe short rate, and they will invest less. So their kappa N will be lower. Uh, and uh, gov the government policy can, by choosing holdings of capital and uh, issuing government debt, affect these holding costs uh, because their K wiggle and their uh, holdings of uh, government debt will affect these marginal costs. And so, how does, uh, let me first say a number of things about this setup that we were writing down. First of all, about the, the role of the central bank in this uh, model, it's a real model. So here we focus on risk premia and investment, uh, not price stability. Uh, with flexible prices, you can basically get similar effects uh, in a nominal version of the model. Uh, this goes back to previous work that we've done uh, that looks at flexible monetary policy and flexible price uh, models. So here what we're doing is we're taking basically a medium run perspective. Uh, we think that there have been decades of large central bank uh, balance sheets and now it, the question is how do they affect investment? And so that is a medium run perspective in which uh, things that we usually put into models when we study monetary policy don't matter, such, such as sticky prices. Uh, so in this medium run, uh, sticky prices are no longer the relevant friction uh, and instead we want to think of these financial frictions. Uh, in terms of the balance sheet costs that we're introducing uh, for private intermediaries and the government, uh, they capture a familiar theme in the literature on QE. Uh, so whenever QE stimulates the economy, typically it is because the government is better able to commit to repay debt uh, than the private sector. And that's how you get uh, real effects from QE. 
The new element in this framework is that we have multiple sectors and they have a different severity of frictions that are described by these balance sheet costs H uh, and they end up being reflected in firm level risk premium. Uh, this function H can be identified from effects of purchase programs on sectors cost of capital uh, and so that empirically would extend work on the price impact of quantitative easing on typically we look at government bonds here what we would be interested in the, is the effects on different balance sheet costs of different sectors. And so this is what we're currently working on empirically is to uh, measure these, these cost function age. Uh, there in the model, there may be an interaction of climate externalities and financial frictions because you would expect the parameters in these balance sheet cost function to vary with emission intensity parameters in the cross section. Uh, the reason is that we have empirical evidence that brown firms pay higher premia, so they pay higher cost of capital. Um, so how would the central bank direct capital towards green sectors? Uh, the, so here's our equation again that says uh, the market portfolio uh, equates cost of capital uh, net of these holding costs. Uh, and on the left hand side, uh, you see an inverse relationship uh, between the market share uh, in the sector N and the cost of capital. So that's basically the demand of capital for capital by firms. And on the right hand side, you see the supply of capital from financial intermediaries. I can, because of the properties of this H function, I can replace uh, holdings of capital uh, with shares of holdings of capital uh, and then put everything into a nice graph that shows you the demand and the supply of capital uh, to sector N. Uh, and on the horizontal axis here is the capital share in the sector. And so what the government can do here, uh, because of uh, it can influence these marginal holding costs in of capital in sector N, it can uh, consider increasing its weight uh, on capital in sector N and lower some other weights uh, and thereby increasing the supply of capital uh, to the sector. And then capital increases uh, as you see in this graph. So basically the supply curve shifts to the right uh, and thereby the government can increase supply uh, of capital to the sector and in equilibrium, uh, this sector will have a larger market share, uh, which is uh, not what you see in the frictionless framework. So here really through the financial friction, uh, the gov government can influence how much capital flows in this sector. So the uh, central bank can direct capital towards green sector. The leading example for these costs is a quadratic cost function. Uh, so here we uh, write it down and it has some parameters like sigma squared n, uh, which is the risk captures the riskiness of a typical firm in sector n, which may be correlated, as I just said, with sector uh, emission intensities, uh, epsilon n. There, these quadratic costs, we like them because uh, they introduce a benefit of diversification, just like as in the classic mean variance framework. Uh, and so you can look at the premium on uh, holdings in sector N. You just take the partial derivative of this quadratic cost function and you get an expression that, uh, that is on the bottom of this slide, uh, which shows you the blue terms is just the exposure of private intermediaries to sector N risk. So this is uh, kappa N, which is the total market share in that sector, minus what the government holds of the sector. And so that difference is just what the exposure of private intermediaries is to sector N risk. Uh, safe assets that don't have any risk, so if you set sigma N equal to zero, they have a, may have a negative premium, so that's a convenience yield on safe assets. So the purchase program now can reduce exposures both through kappa wiggle and through delta, which is the amount of government debt to capital. So let's look at how this uh, uh, works. Uh, we can ask in the setup, uh, what would be a market neutral purchase? Uh, so a market neutral policy leaves 
relative returns, let's say from sector N to sector one unchanged. Uh, so you start from a laissez-faire equilibrium with zero government debt, and you do a comparative static to an equilibrium with a government with positive amounts of debt. Uh, and then market neutrality would say you get the same market portfolio as in the laissez-faire equilibrium uh, after this policy. So you get the same market portfolio. How would the asset purchases look like that keep this market portfolio unchanged? Uh, the asset purchases are financed with safe government debt. That is going to lead to a GE effect, so a general equilibrium effect, because more safe debt will lower the risk premia, the marginal costs of holding capital in the sector, especially in risky sectors. So the effects will be larger for those sectors that have the large premia. And so what to be market neutral, you cannot just buy proportional to market shares. You have to underweigh risky sectors because they benefit more uh, from having more safe government debt. So you have to undo the GE effect to be market neutral. So if you had to uh, um, recommend to a central bank how to do their asset purchases so that they have no relative uh, price distortions. What you would say is that uh, underway risky sectors because these risky sectors will benefit the most uh, from your policies. Uh, what is the special case in which uh, uh, this is not true, you don't get this GE effect. It's only if this cost function H is separable. So if the marginal costs of holding capital in a sector don't depend on the quantity of safe government debt, only in that case are market neutral purchases proportional to the market portfolio. So this is a very special system, a financial system, in which safe government debt doesn't lower risk premium. So the typical model in the literature and the typical conventional view of quantitative easing is that uh, by introducing more safe government debt, uh, you lower risk premium. Basically, in this special case, you, un you, you shut that off uh, and in the, only in that case are market neutral purchases proportional to the market portfolio. In all other cases, uh, market neutral portfolio uh, underweighs risky sectors. We can also ask um, within our quadratic uh, cost framework how this looks exactly. So here again the premium on sector N uh, looks like this and then you uh, can look at the relative premia of sector N and sector 1 and you're basically staring at relative exposures uh, of sector of intermediaries to the, the two sectors uh, N and 1. What are what is the exact uh, market neutral portfolio that the central bank uh, would have to buy? So what you see here is that these relative premia uh, and market shares would have to be independent of what the government does. That's the delta here. Uh, and the, so the solution uh, to this problem is for the government to pick a portfolio that in finance, uh, in mean variance uh, parlor, is called the minimum cost portfolio. So you're basically choosing a portfolio that minimizes these holding costs. Uh, and so that's a constant uh, divided by the risk of that sector. That, that is a market neutral portfolio. Uh, so again, what you're looking at is a formula that underweighs risky sectors. This is what I just said. Um, so the higher the risk of the sector, that's the sigma squared n, uh, the lower the portfolio share of the central bank in that sector. So again, market neutral purchases uh, do not uh, buy the market portfolio. Uh, what is optimal policy? Uh, so the optimal thing is for the social planner to choose a carbon tax and then design an asset purchase program. And so here the principle of targeting in public finance applies. Uh, so you basically you use uh, the best instrument to fix the climate externality. So you pick the carbon tax to fix the climate externality and you design the purchase program to finance to address financial frictions. Uh, you don't necessarily design it to, to address the climate externality. You just focus on the financial frictions. And so the optimal government portfolio solves uh, the following equation. It equates the marginal private holding costs of uh, holding capital in sector N to the marginal government holding costs plus the effect of the government on private holding costs. 
so that's the equation the optimal portfolio would choose. So that, of course, depends on how exactly these cost functions look like. But suppose the government marginal costs are the same across sector, uh, then what the optimal asset uh, purchase program would do is basically equate all these premia. Uh, and again, that would lower the premia for the risky sectors the most. And again, optimal policy would not be neutral in this world. Uh, to get something that is that looks neutral, it would require a knife edge condition. So let me summarize what I uh, showed you. I showed you uh, an empirical result that says uh, in the data, uh, what the ECB has been doing so far, it has assembled a portfolio that looks like the sector shares of emissions. It does not look like the market portfolio. Uh, theoretically, uh, market neutral portfolio uh, purchases are not necessarily in proportion uh, to the market portfolio. Uh, in fact, in our leading example with quadratic costs, um, because purchases are financed with more government debt, uh, it lowers the cost of capital for risky sectors the most. And so what market neutral purchases would have to do is to downweigh risky sectors. Uh, Dirty sectors are risky. In the data, we have evidence of a pollution premium. And so we know that ECB, uh, the current ECB portfolio is not market neutral because it is overweighing risky, risky and dirty sectors as opposed to downweighing them. With the carbon tax, or without climate externalities, uh, the optimal purchases simply focus on financial frictions. And so that would mean to overweigh risky and dirty sectors because you're uh, lowering their uh, cost of capital. Your, your goal is to lower their cost of capital. The most they have the st uh, strongest friction. And so you want to overweigh uh, risky and dirty sectors. Uh, without a carbon tax, purchases should overweigh green sectors uh, because that's uh, that helps. So without a carbon tax, optimal or a, a better monetary policy would overweigh green sectors. Uh, but this is not what we see the ECB doing. Uh, so if you think about in which world could the ECB policy be optimal, um, may, if there were no climate externalities, maybe in that world, um, ECB, uh, the ECB policy was, uh, could be optimal. But that's not the world we live in, of course. Thank you very much. Thanks, Monica. That was, that was a, a really uh, very uh, clear and very uh, powerful sort of set of results there. We've had a um, uh, a number of questions that, are, that have come in, so I'm, I'm going to uh, read out the questions and then uh, maybe we just take them one at a time and then. Uh, so the, the first question actually follows on from one of the last bullet points that you had on your, on your concluding slides. This is from Juan uh, Gutierrez, who's a university student. Who says, in the absence of a carbon tax, what measures can be taken to mitigate polluting emissions and who should be responsible for them, whether it's governments or central banks, firms or other supranational organisations? Yeah, so the, 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 the answer from the model is that uh, central banks can do their part in the absence of a carbon tax. So if uh, Congress and parliaments cannot agree on a carbon tax, the central banks can help by directing uh, funds to sectors that are cleaner. Uh, and the way to do it is to buy their assets. Um, and so that lowers uh, the cost of capital for these sectors. Uh, and so then um, these sectors can produce more in equilibrium. Uh, and so the, this, this is within the framework of, of the model, uh, central bank can help here uh, if, if parliaments don't do their job. Uh, of course, ideally, uh, optimal policy is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the planner would not do this. The planner would say there should be a carbon tax uh, and then uh, monetary policy can focus on what it's good at, which is um, minimize financial frictions. OK, great. We, we've had another question come in uh, from Rafa Rapula from, from Sanfi. It's actually got a two part question, so let, let me take it uh, one part at a time. So the first question is, what if QE is not a permanent feature of monetary policy? Could we think of a future situation in which central banks hold little corporate debts? Uh, 
Yes, that's a great question. Uh, we, we all hope that QE is not going to be a permanent fixture of monetary policy because uh, that would mean that we're getting away from this zero lower bound or some effective lower bound uh, at which interest rates have been for, for a long while since the financial crisis. Uh, and so hopefully we're going to get away from that because it, it would mean that we're growing more and there's also some inflation, which is a good thing. Right now we don't have any inflation. Uh, and then monetary policy can go back to just uh, targeting the interest rate. Uh, this is the usual monetary policy that we used to talk about until the global financial crisis was all about high, high, how high should interest rates be. Now we're reduced to saying, uh, what else can the central bank do? Buy some assets. Uh, and so this is what they have all been doing is buying assets. Uh, from experience, from the experience so far, once uh, the central bank buys an asset, it stays on the balance sheet for a long time. So it's not like uh, the uh, central bank buys an asset and then it goes away after a few years. Instead, central banks have been buying assets and then these assets just stay on the balance sheet. They're, they have long maturities. Some of these assets have very long maturities and so they just hang around. And so the, the problem of having a balance sheet is going to, uh, a large balance sheet is going to be around for quite a bit. For the next decades, we're going to have central banks with large balance sheets because the assets that they're holding, they tend to hold them. And so I view this problem as something that is going to be relevant for the foreseeable future. So we'll be talking about central bank portfolios for quite a while. Okay, so let's come to the second part of, of Rafa's question, which is, um, is it obvious that risk and dirt are, are positively correlated? Perhaps that relationship could depend on the investment horizon. Yes, uh, so the, uh, the finance literature uh, is, uh, that, that's an essential tenant of the uh, asset pricing literature, is that you get a higher reward uh, when you take on more risk. Uh, and so this connection is there. Uh, it, uh, you're absolutely right. The, the investment horizon matters. Uh, so it matters for how long uh, you're holding the asset. That matters for how much risk is in the asset. Some assets are very risky in the short term, but have less risk in the longer run. Uh, and so the how exactly this risk return trade off looks like uh, depends a lot on the investment horizon. And so in terms of the model, you would have to think about uh, what is the cost of capital that the central bank tries to influence? Is it uh, something that is just uh, measured from one day to the next, which is the typical work on the price impact of QE, the typical empirical work, just looks at what happens uh, on the day of the purchase or uh, in the week of the purchase. And that is very high frequency. Uh, and so the question raises an important uh, issue, which is, what you would like to ideally have is a measure of how these purchases affect the cost of capital over, let's say, a year or two years or three years, because that's the relevant investment horizon for farms. That's a very important issue. Okay, great. Um, so let me just uh, abuse my position and just uh, ask a question myself. So I was wondering whether you can apply the model to other forms of externalities. So I'm, I'm thinking about sectors that have you know, impacts on, on, on TFP, say through R&D, or if you think about propagation within the economy um, or, or, or various uh, shocks. So is there something specific about climate here or can we use this framework to think about how bond purchases should be targeted in the presence of other externalities? This is a wonderful question and it's a, it's, it's a feature of the model that we only realized when, once we wrote it down and started presenting it. Uh, people asked us, um, if I'm not interested in the climate at all, I don't believe in climate externalities, uh, what, could I still use the model? And the answer is, of course, uh, if you have one sector that is affecting other sectors, uh, then uh, the setup would tell you how to direct um, asset purchases of central banks uh, to undo these externalities. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, it's great that you're seeing this immediately. We only realized this uh, after working on this setup for a while and and meeting people who don't who are not interested in climate externalities. I am very much interested in climate externalities. <laughs> it just seems like an, a, a, an additional application. Um, 
So um, just the next question is uh, also from Rafael Rapolo. So imagine a situation with only two types of firms, uh, green firms with high intangible capital and little debt, and traditional brown firms with high tangible capital and lots of debt. In this situation, a central bank buying corporate debt could only hold brown assets. Are you then suggesting that central banks buy ETFs on a stock market index? Yes, uh, so the, another wonderful question uh, because the if uh, green firms don't issue bonds or don't issue many bonds, uh, then there's nothing for uh, a corporate bond purchase program to buy. Uh, there are no assets to buy if these companies don't issue bonds. And so the question for central banks then becomes, what should they be buying? Uh, so the answer of the Swiss, Nas uh, Swiss National Central Bank uh, is to buy equity. Uh, and so they have been buying firm equity. And so that's a great idea if these companies don't issue bonds. Um, an alternative might be to think about how to uh, help for central banks might be able to uh, help build an infrastructure so that there is private equity. Private equity is something that is uh, still to the largest extent missing in Europe. Uh, it's underdeveloped relative to the US. And so the banking system has to uh, do, a, has a very heavy burden because it has to select the green companies uh, that it believes will be successful and then lend to those companies. Uh, this is better achieved through private equity. Uh, so the selection out of many risky projects, uh, private equity is, is more efficient at that selection. Uh, and so in the absence of private equity, uh, it has to be banks. Uh, and so it's much better if central banks were to help um, to put in an infrastructure that features uh, private equity. Uh, so one of the two, either buy equity directly or um, help build the infrastructure. Okay. Um, can, I, can I push you a little bit on the distinction between uh, clean sectors and clean firms? Yeah. So within a sector, we'd imagine there's quite a lot of heterogeneity in the cleanliness of firms. And so there seems to be a, a, a tension in the sense that ideally you'd want to target sort of the cleanliness of firms. Yeah. But by doing so, you could have some kind of distortions created by those firms pretending to be cleaner than they, than they are. And so you could use the sector as an overall label. So how do you think about where, where, how to optimally try to resolve that trade off where you want to really target and benefit the cleanest firms, um, but you only have the sector as a potential label by which to do that? Yes, uh, so the, the data so the, the model uh, focuses on uh, the implications uh, for sectors uh, and then the typical firm within the sector. But as you uh, raise an, an important question is what if you have heterogeneity within the sector? There is data, the data on uh, emissions is by firm. So you can actually look in the data uh, which firms are the ones that are cleaner uh, and which ones are dirtier. So you could target within sector by firm based on the emissions data. So this is something that is feasible to do. Um, so you could you can do the data situation uh, allows you to target uh, clean firms within the sector. It's uh, in terms of the data situation, it is surprising how uh, consistent uh, scope one emission data are for individual firms across data sources. So when we started working on uh, the emissions data, I thought uh, maybe these are just some random numbers that firms uh, put together. Uh, but actually, if you look at across data providers, um, emissions data for individual firms are quite consistent. So that suggests that uh, you may be able to quite accurately target individual firms. OK, that, that's wonderful, Monica. I think we're right up against time. Uh, it's uh, 4 p.m. in London and 5 p.m. In, in Madrid, so probably we should bring um, the lecture to a close. So let me thank you again for uh, speaking and giving the lecture thank this year. It's been absolutely wonderful. I'm very much looking forward to seeing the paper come out in print uh, later, later this year. And let me thank everybody in, in the audience for attending and uh, submitting their questions. And uh, I hope everybody uh, well in these times and uh, a good evening and uh, hopefully see you again soon for the next lecture in a, in a, in a year's time.